and add just species that were also alive during the Holocene that humans basically ate, this is what it looks like. So there are two things to notice. One, the diversity is a lot higher. And two, sort of our super flight losers, the ducks and geese have gone from 5 to 14 species. Rails have gone from 20 to 36. This is just named species. Again, this is probably a huge underestimate. There are probably hundreds, maybe over a thousand flightless rails. <coughs> so flight has been great for birds. Why would they lose flight? One reason is potentially to conserve energy. Flight demand, in birds at least, flight demand is a huge pectoralis muscle that costs a lot of energy <coughs> to build and maintain. Uh, we've observed that birds that lose flight, this is the, the bunting that I showed you guys, and its sister species really rapidly lose keel size and lose pectoralis size. And in fact, in, um, in grebes, or sorry, in rails, um, we've done a study, multiple studies that we noticed that rails that lose flight, again, very quickly uh, evolve smaller pectoralis and a lower base of metabolic rate. Both these things imply that there's potentially strong selection against the large pectoralis muscle if you don't need it. Another reason to lose flight is to escape body plan limitations. Birds are highly evolved for flight, but this puts some uh, life history strategies off limits, like a large terrestrial grazing herbivore, um, like this rhea. We've also noticed in grebes that when they lose flight, they rapidly become much heavier with respect to their body size compared to their sisters. Um, another reason potentially to lose flight, this has been looked at in insects, but not birds yet, but I think it's kind of a cool, cool idea, is maybe to stay on small islands, just to not get blown off small islands. You wouldn't think birds would uh, succumb to this, but, but it seems like they do. This is a clapper rail. It's endemic, or it just lives basically on salt marshes uh, right along the coast, but they disperse broadly. And there's a study done in the deep pelagic waters off the Carolinas where they opened up five tiger shark stomachs and then all five they found clapper rails. So, and again, rails are the ones that are losing flight a lot. So this may have something to do with it, although it, it's not shown. I just think it's a cool story. Um, so flight is most often lost in the absence of predators, especially terrestrial flight. We've known this for a while. And we've also known for a while that some lineages lose flight more often and more rapidly than others. In fact, Darwin even mentioned uh, that that was interesting, an origin of species. So is there something maybe about these groups that potentially predisposes them to lose flight? And I think there might be. And to explain that, I'm sort of going to back up and explain a little bit about how birds replace their feathers. So birds' feathers wear down pretty rapidly, and they need to replace them every year. And they face a lot of challenges doing that, one of which is how they replace their primary and secondary flight feathers. The reason this is a challenge is because the feathers are big, um, and they take a long time to grow. And when birds replace their feathers, they drop the old feather and then they grow in a new one. So if birds just dropped all their feathers, especially all the flight feathers, they wouldn't be able to fly. So what most birds do is they have a sequential style of primary uh, replacement where they just replace more or less one at a time so they can maintain the ability to fly during the molting period. Um, slightly bigger birds have a stepwise molt, or what we call a staffelmauser, where they have multiple waves of molt going out the wing. This simply balances, um, this just accounts for birds that are too big to replace their feathers in one pass in one year. And then there are other birds that have a simultaneous molt strategy. Um, and this is conserved back to the family level. So all ducks do this, all geese, all grebes, all rails, a few other things. Where they drop all their primary and secondary flight feathers at once and they go through a completely flightless period while molting. This lasts usually about three to four weeks. It's too long to be able to fast. So these birds, all birds, need to be able to eat and escape predators while molting. These birds have to do it without being Another thing to mention about simultaneous molt is it's an example um, of pedomorphosis. Uh, it, all young birds in the nest, their first molt is simultaneous, so they grow on all their flight feathers at once. Um, so simultaneous molters just retain this into their adult, um, into their adult stages. So this fun falls under the really broad tent of heterochrony, um, which Gould describes evolutionary as a laboratory for morphological experimentation because Small changes in developmental timing can often, as we saw again in the last talk, can often uh, make for really big morphological, ecological advances over rapid time periods, like beetles losing their wings. Or like salamanders going from a terrestrial to an aquatic uh, life history strategy simply by retaining their larval gills. So most birds, 97% of birds have a non-simultaneous molt strategy. They retain the ability to fly while molting. 
3% of birds have a simultaneous full strategy. Again, it's retained about the family level. So when we look at all of these Holocene flightless birds, including the Castamalans, they're vastly overrepresented as simultaneous emitters. So 68% of them are in families that have simultaneous molt strategy. So maybe selection during the flightless molting period to be able to eat and be able to escape predators without flying provides these birds with pre-adaptations to a flightless lifestyle so they can rapidly evolve uh, flightlessness when the conditions are favor. So, put in another way, the hypothesis would be that loss of flight is more likely if preceded by simultaneous mole, whereas a null hypothesis would be that mole strategy has no effect on the loss of flight. So the way I tested this, I used a program called Bayes Traits that estimates evolutionary transition rates. I mean, can even estimate uh, the transition rate of one character given the background of another character. Uh, the tree I used was the Yetz super tree. It includes all birds. Um, only about two-thirds of the birds in this tree have any character data at all, and a lot of it's pretty sparse. But the neat thing about this tree um, is you can get a lot of trees out of it. Um, and so what it does is it allows the tips to vary and move around between the trees based on the confidence and the placement of those tips. So what you can do is you can run your analysis over all the trees and get an idea of how the phylogenetic uncertainty is affecting the analysis. But that tree doesn't have the extinct birds, and so I had to incorporate the extinct birds into the tree. And so I used a pretty similar, I pretty much did the same thing as they did um, in the Jets tree to incorporate the birds that didn't have any character data. I just put the birds randomly into their genus. So here we have three extinct grebes. The one at the top is flightless. These two are flighted. There are two other flightless grebes. So basically, if we just had the extant birds, we'd get a transition rate of two out of about 22. But if we, we know there's a third one, so we want the transition rate to be more like three out of 22. Um, and so each bird just follows its genus around in the different trees and gets stuck in a And so I did that with all the extant birds, or all the Holocene flightless birds. So if we just look at the whole tree, the blue bubbles um, represent simultaneous molt, the red bubbles represent flightlessness. You can see flight is lost, usually preceded by the blue bubbles. This line right here, these are, are ostriches and penguins and stuff that lost flight a few times a really long time ago. What's that? Ten. Ten? Thank you. Uh, so Bayes' traits can estimate eight possible transitions. It's just flight to non-flight, non-simultaneous to simultaneous, given a background of, uh, of each other. What we're interested in is these two transitions. Um, flight to non-flight, given a background of simultaneous mole, or given a background of non-simultaneous. Um, and, and the differences are significantly different. These numbers actually, I meant to change those. Those aren't right. But, so what's important, so here's our posterior probability density. So the x-axis is just an estimation of the transition rate, and the y-axis is, is how many, on how many trees that rate was estimated. So this is loss of flight within the context of simultaneous mole. This is loss of flight. That little blip down there is loss of flight, not with simultaneous mold. The important thing about this is that loss of flight within the context of simultaneous mold is significantly higher than the other. It's also never estimated to be zero, whereas loss of flight not within the context of simultaneous mold is often, not always, but often estimated to be, to be zero. When we look at the proportion of losses of flight that are preceded by simultaneous mold versus not preceded by simultaneous mold, this x-axis is just the proportions, this is 100% and 0%. It's almost always 100% estimated by uh, simultaneous mold. The y axis is, again, just density. It's just the number of trees where that proportion is estimated. So, where are we at? Uh, you just got four minutes. Perfect. Um, so, I'm not saying simultaneous mold is the only path to flightlessness, but it certainly seems to facilitate rapid loss of flight. Like these birds, these super flight lizards like rails and ducks, especially, probably by giving them pre adaptations for a flightless lifestyle. Um, need to be able to get food, they need to be able to skip predators without flying. So they're basically ready to be flightless when we get into a situation where that's beneficial. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks.